for those of you who were not with me last week, we ended up with a part one and a part two. And I'm not going to take as much time. I just wanted to hit a couple of highlights to bring us back into our thinking, bring us back together. It still followed well with the Parsha of this week because it's so much on rebellion, so much on, it, it, you know, I'm sorry, but we, we do all have one problem in common, and that is pride. That's, that's just it. We just do. And there's so much rebellion and pride in this parasha. There's so much, you know, that we think we know better than God. Really? <laughs> really? So, you know, it, uh, uh, but I entitled last week that seeing isn't believing, but believing is seeing. And we talked about all the different manifestations that God had taken our children of Israel through from the parting of the, well, from the plagues, the ten plagues, to the parting of the Red Sea, and on, seeing the, the manifestation of God in the Shekinah glory, seeing it move with them, seeing it direct them, seeing it lead them. And when we wanted to call them out short, we had to remind ourselves, how do we live our lives? Do we not also have mountaintop experiences? And then, for me, God for forbid, I mean, I'm ashamed, but how soon after a mountaintop experience I can find myself either wanting to be concerned about something or just not having that right attitude. So even though we're calling them out, we're calling them out to teach us. We're calling them out so that we can learn from it. And we saw that the main theme running through all of this is that the just shall live by their faith. That faith is a noun and an action word both at the same time and that we need to be active in our faith. This is the way that we're going to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord because that's what happened to our children of Israel. They, well, and I'll take it back further than that, and I did last week, it took us all the way back to the garden, and what we have is the hissing sound of the enemy who's brought in fear, who's brought in a lie, who has had the audacity to cause you to question, has God said? You know, is that really right? And that fear, that voice that we don't want to hear, that that's constantly what gets all of us in trouble because it's the exact opposite of our faith. And that we cannot move with faith and fear at the same time. It's either faith or it's fear. We saw that we wanted to look at our book of Hebrews because our children of Israel struggled in this, this time in our parsha. But we went forward to the first century AD and we find our children of Israel struggling there also. And the common denominator is their faith. We, even though we have the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11, and we know that there's so much example in there that I don't care what you're going through, you can find someone who's got the corner on the market in that chapter and say, wow, and, and how they came shining through in their faith. So we do. We look because we want to learn. We want to be encouraged. And, Sha'ol Paul, I believe, to be the author of Hebrews, is writing to our Hebrew people at a time when they were in danger of going back to the Judaistic rituals. They were wanting to go back to the temple, but not just to go back to the temple to attend a prayer service. No, they were literally considering going back to the sacrificial system. And you might think, well, how could they do that? Well, you've got to remember, this has been ingrained in them year after year after year, generation after generation, and it was so critically important that if they were to be right with God, they had to be going through the system. Now they've been led into believing and understanding accurately that the Lamb of God had come. The perfect sacrifice had been given, and there was no longer a need for the animal sacrifices that were pointing to it. And they embraced that. But like will happen in anything, anywhere, you'll have those who really embrace it because they believe it in their heart. Full conviction within the heart. And then you have those who get caught up with excitement and it looks good and they go along and they follow with the crowd. But they're the ones especially that are going to have that hissing sound coming in because the conviction isn't there. They're tasting it. They're getting an idea of what it's like, but it hasn't taken root in their hearts. And these were the ones that were in danger of falling back. And Paul takes them on very, very strongly. He warns them that if they back away from Yeshua, if they back away from the atoning sacrifice of his blood, there is no way of salvation. Now, as soon as I say that, then you need to realize the depth of the importance of, this, of, of what is being said. 
because nothing else matters in the end except our salvation. Whether we get there on a, a in, in a limousine, whether we get there in a jalopy, <laughs> what matters is re getting to our final destination. And I am not one who believes for a moment that you can lose what God has freely given to you. I'm not for a moment giving you that idea. But if it's not been a heart acceptance, if you have only been caught up with the frenzy, if you've been going with the crowd, if you've been thinking it intellectually, as a good tract says, don't miss heaven by 18 inches, the distance from the head to the heart, because it's not about facts. This is a matter of the heart. And so it's very important that we continue on and we realize, and we're going to be looking in Hebrews chapter 3. I started it, and I'm going to back up to verse 7 in chapter 3, flying through the part that we've already done. But this is that second warning in this book of Hebrews. There's going to be five total warnings. God's grace. He warns, and he warns, and he warns, and he warns, and he warns again. He, he's long-suffering and so patient, and he's giving heed to them to, to realize that unbelief, is the result of a hardening of their heart. And that's what kept the children of Israel from entering the promised land. It was a hardening of their heart. It was unbelief. They fell short because of their unbelief. There was not action to back up what they were professing. And it's not a matter of what you profess, it's a matter of what you possess. So with that example, we look now again at verse 7 in chapter 3, and not going into the full detail, we saw that it was a, a quote from Tehillim, from Psalm 95. We see in that that the psalm is written by David, but it gives credit to being through the, the Ruch Kodesh, the Holy Spirit. So when it started out with the verse, therefore, it's in view of what's been said, in view of what's come in the first two chapters of Hebrews, which showed them who God the Son is, in view of who he is, in view of him being greater than the angels, greater than the prophets, in view of him being this one that we know Dovarim, Deuteronomy 18 says, there'd be a prophet who would come greater than Moshe. When he comes, hear him. Knowing this to be that greater than, and we can go through a whole lesson that will show us so many ways that he was greater than Moshe. The, the same foundation, but greater. The same greater, greater, greater. Knowing this, hearing this, seeing this attributed even as far back as Melch David and the credit going, and in both, one gives credit to Yeshua, one gives credit to Yehovah. We see that we have our triunity at one, working together and crediting it all to one another because they all are one. This is what you're to hear now, to hear his voice today. And that today is key because even though Shaul Paul used that in first century, that's 2024 also. That's what I love about our Word of God. It's the living Word of God. This is not dead works. This is not the, the sayings of dead people. This is the holy living Word of the holy living God, and we are to hear it. So today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. That's their warning. And it actually, that if tells you there's something contingent here. If you hear. Now, if you're not hearing, you're already in trouble. Because if you're not hearing the voice of God, you are not in the right place. So you're, you're already in trouble. Your heart's already been hardened, and you need to change that heart to hear his voice. And when it says his, that's a very clearly Mashiach, Messiah, because that's the one that they've been talking about. The one that, that's been represented in chapter 1 in the very beginning where God said he spoke in times past through the prophets. He spoken in the last days by his son. The son that is over the house that Moshe served in. This is showing you the greater one. It also shows you that Yeshua is God. He is the son of God and he is very God himself. It is his voice that we're to hear. That's who has spoken to us. And when we listen, then we won't have this issue. We won't harden our hearts. And so as verse 8 says, harden not. And the tense is don't go on hardening. It's as if they're already in that motion and they're, they're being called back. I see someone standing at the edge of a, of a precipice and someone rushing up and this one is standing there saying, no, slow down, you're going to go over the cliff, it's going to be your fall. And if they don't 
heed that, so they don't listen, then they are going to go right over the cliff to their demise. Harden it not. Don't go on in the way that you're going on. Do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. That word provoke, and by the way, the example being given is the children of Israel in the wilderness that hardened their hearts against God and didn't get to go into the promised land. They continually, we're going to see the ten times they tried God. I don't want to try God once. <laughs> well, you know how God took it? He was provoked. He says they provoked him. Other English words for this is exasperation. I don't want God exasperated with me. But they were provoking God's mind against them in the same way that they murmured against Moshe. And look at what they did in this parasha, how even after God showed his displeasure with those who rebelled and who called it out and said, it should be me, and they weren't going with who God's choice was, even after the earth swallowed them up, the next day, we're not going past 24 hours. The next day, they're coming up in Moshe's face, and they're ready to stone him. They're done with him. Okay. Okay. So, they provoked God. It says, as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. And that day means that period of time. That's not the 24 hour, but it was 24 hours later when they took Moshe on. Okay, and that, you may have the word trial, you may have the word testing, as in the day of testing or day of trial, it is to put to the test. And that's what I found extremely eye-opening to what was going on. They were putting God to the test. Oh, yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, this shows me the long-suffering mercy of God. Because I think any one of us who would be put to the test by someone inferior, someone who doesn't have the right and doesn't, shouldn't own that position, and in our humanity, we're going to say, oh yeah? <laughs> oh yeah? <laughs> let me show you <laughs> that God doesn't do that. He didn't let them off with it either, though. He didn't let them show him that disrespect. But he uh, allowed them, as they were going through that time, to try to awaken them. And yet there was a severe consequence to their actions. And he said that in that putting him to the test, or I shouldn't say he, but the Greek meaning behind that is to see what good or evil is in a person. Now, if they're trying a God to see if he's a good God or if he's an evil God, again, I am just amazed that they weren't turned into crispy critters on the spot. And nobody could fault God if he had done it, you know, to be very honest. It, but it was this if to see how much would God bear? How much could they get away with? And suddenly I see a little child who is trying his parents. He knows how to push their buttons and he knows just how far he can. And then he'll pull back if he's smart because he doesn't want to get that wrath. But if he's not smart, he keeps on going and hits the wrath also. But what an insult to God. The God who spared them. The God who took them out of slavery. The God who's been feeding them. The God who has been providing everything they need. Shelter, provision, food, water, every necessity. This is a God that they're saying, you need to prove yourself to me. Are you good, God, or are you not? Do you not hear the hiss all the way back in the garden again? Has God not said? And so that doubt into their minds that God would be anything other than all truth and all good. And it, we're told in Shemot and Exodus 17, 7, they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? How could they question that? How could they question with what they were seeing, literally seeing with their eyes day and night, with what they were eating, with what they were drinking, everything that was happening to them was a manifestation of God in some way. And yet this is what they were doing. Instead of trusting God, they were demanding that he demonstrate that he was in their midst. And how he could do that beyond what he'd already done, I don't even have a clue what they would want. You know, other than what they really wanted, their own way. That's really the bottom line. And these Jewish people now, these Hebrew people are being warned, don't follow that example. Look where it got them. It got them dead 
in the wilderness. It says their carcasses fell in the wilderness. That's not a nice, pretty picture. That's a pretty revolting picture. <laughs> but instead of that, trust God. Trust God. God is bringing them on this journey. He's not just bringing them physically on the journey. He's bringing them on their spiritual journey. He is trying to grow them up in him spiritually. And that's what he's doing with all of us today. So keep that in mind as we go on as to how it applies to yourself. He says, they saw my works for 40 years. Again and again and again and again, they saw his work for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation, and I call that holy anger. I do not call that anything short that God had a right. He was wroth with the people. He was loathed with them. He disgusted by them. He wanted to spew them out of his mouth. He was so angry and so disgusted because he was offended at their actions, and rightfully so. He had given them nothing to deserve this kind of treatment. And how many of us put yourself in those shoes that have been mistreated for no reason? And how do you take it? How does the flesh rise up then? Well, it wasn't God's flesh, but it was the Spirit of God that did become angry, became grieved with them, with that whole generation, and said they always go astray in their heart. They do not know my ways. Now that know, that's knowledge that's gained by experience. They're gaining that experience. If they didn't know it day one, what should they know by, by year five and year 10 and year 20? How can they be so ignorant of this? I honestly, I'm not cutting them slack. I'm not saying we're better, but I'm not going to cut them slack because it was so evident. It was blatantly evident. And when it says that they didn't know his ways, that doesn't mean that they didn't know what he was doing. Obviously they knew he was feeding them, he was protecting them, he kept their clothes from, from wearing out their sandals. I haven't had a pair of shoes last for 40 years. <laughs> so obviously they knew that, but what it's saying is that they didn't know him. They didn't know his character. They didn't know his, character really says it best. Think of the 13 attributes. It was named again in the last week, Parsha, from his loving kindness and his mercy and his grace and, and his forgiveness and all of that. That's what they didn't know. They were clueless. Have you ever been around somebody and thought, they don't get me? They just don't even know me? They don't understand and they're missing the whole picture? That's where these people were. They were missing the whole thing. They did not know him even though he upfront and personal presented himself to them in a very hands-on, tangible way. It wasn't abstract that they couldn't see it. It was there. So that's why with that in mind, verse 11, as I swore in my wrath and my anger toward them, they shall not enter into my rest. They don't deserve the promised land and they're not going to get the promised land. That's just it. He finally, the consequence fell. And it didn't fall until that had happened 10 times. But Midbar, Numbers 14, verses 22 and 23, tells us that it was after the 10th temptation, the 10th trial, when they were trying God for the 10th time, that's when he finally said, that's long enough. That's long suffering. That's patience. That's grace. That's mercy. And so he did finally say, they certainly shall not enter my rest. And that's a Hebrew idiom. It's a very strong negative. And in essence, with no disrespect to my God, man, they basically could be said, may I not be Jehovah if they enter in. That's, it was, it was over. There was no bargaining. There was no coming around. There was no, oh, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. I'll do it right this time. No, it was done. It was done. That rest would be a cessation of activity and the idea would behind it was even that it would be like a permanent rest for them. It would be a rest if, if they had gone on and entered into Canaan the way that they were supposed to, they would have had peace in the land also. The rest would be the rest that only God could give. It would be from him. It would be a contrast to slavery in Egypt. 
if they would be in that land with their enemies defeated. This is what God promised in Davarim in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. You can look it up and read it later, that God promised them, and I think I'll even quote it in just a bit for you. Finally, Israel will know this. Finally, in the millennial kingdom. Israel as a nation will be in the land and the enemies will be defeated because the Lord's sitting on his throne and anything that would come up, the Lord would put a stop to immediately with the rod of iron that he is going to judge with. But for our children of Israel who have gone on and to bring it up into 2024, yes, they're in the land. But are they in that land with that kind of rest? No, no. They have not had that since day one. May 14, 1948, they were reborn as a nation. What happened May 15, 1948? Attacked. Attacked by six nations that wanted to strangle an infant, that wanted to take the breath out of that little baby before it could be established on its own. And it's against all odds that our God is victory. That's all you need. God is victory. But even today, in that land, even though through time they've had others take control of the land and who have subdued them in their own land, even today when they are their own government in that land, they still don't have peace. It's still not a shalom. They're still battling for it. They're fighting for their very survival today in America. Don't miss that. That's what's going on. This is not... That, that we're fighting over a toy and we need to learn to share. They're fighting for their very life because those that they're fighting against still literally want to annihilate them, want to snuff out the very breath. How our scriptures 2,000 years ago can be so relevant to today. And God is so faithful through it all. So again in verse 12, he says, take heed, take care. He warns them again, be watching, have your eyes open. And what are you to take heed of? Yourself. Self-exam here. Don't worry about everybody else. You need to look at yourself. And you need to check because what they're to heed right here is that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. That should put the fear of God in you. That what that saying is, lest there be in you this evil. Evil is the opposite of good, but it's far greater than just a, a red, green, black, white. This, when you realize there's one called the evil one. He's the one who is sowing into the heart of the heart that does not yet belong to the Lord. And even to the hearts that belong to the Lord, he hisses in their ear to confuse, to deceive, to trouble, to sow in fear and doubt, and to say, where's your God? Why is he letting you hurt like this? Where's your God? How many of you asked for this and it's not been answered? Your God doesn't care. He went on vacation on you. And whatever else lie he puts into your ears. You don't want a moment of allowing the evil one to sow into your heart that your heart might fail. It might sow a seed of unbelief. It might sow a seed that, that's unbelieving of our living God. Do you know that's calling God a liar? That's calling God out? I don't want to be doing that either any more than I want to be testing God or putting him to the test and, and expecting him like he owes me anything. Oh, oh, and that unbelief, the idea behind it is not just, you know, I, I, I don't believe that, I don't get that. No, this is a, a pernicious heart. This is a heart that's refusing to believe. And I'm sure you have come up against that when you have been a light to someone in darkness who absolutely, no matter what proof you give, is not going to move. They are stubborn. They have put their feet down and they are just determined that no matter what you say, it's not right and they're not going to believe it and they're rebelling against it. That unbelieving heart that is refusing to believe and that's what results in falling away. That's what happens so that they literally miss the promise. That's what apostasy is. People use that word too lightly today, but apostasy is really rejecting a former belief in favor when it's diametrically opposed to what that first belief was. 
And that's the degree that Satan works in there. That's why he takes when the seed of, of God goes into the ground and the weeds come to choke it out and the hardness of the soil to choke it out, to not allow it to take root because he's trying to sow that discord. He's trying to sow that lie. He's trying to bring you to that apostasy because Sha'ol wisely knew, Paul wisely knew, if they turn away, there's nothing that can save them. And they're not likely to turn around and come back. They're not going to be flip-flopping because it either is or it isn't. And so if they're making this profession, if they've gone out there boldly and saying, hey, I believe in Messiah, I believe he's our high priest, I believe he's a sacrifice, and then they renounce that, and then they say, ah, uh, you know, I don't think so. I think I better get back to the temple, and I think I better get there with my sacrifice, and I better do the sacrifice for all the sins I've missed. And they're starting to go back and move away from the cross. Remember last week we talked about how they were drifting past the safe harbor of their salvation. They were turning away from the living God. And what are they turning to? Nothing else is alive. It's idolatry of any type that's dead. There is nothing else alive except our living God. And so in this, in even in seeing the judgment that the children of Israel fell in the wilderness and didn't get to enter into the promise, this is what they should take to their hearts so that we can look at verse 13 and it says, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it's still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Notice deceit. You don't want to fall in that category where you're deceived and where you believe that lie of deceit. But how are we going to, to help one another stay away from it? Is to encourage one another. To come alongside our fellow believer who is struggling, who is beginning to want to ask those questions that are so wrong. Who is beginning to want to say, well, where is God? And does he care? And is to stop them from that and remind them God is with you in the storm. God is carrying you. God is there for you to turn to comfort and to help. Don't let this lie enter in. And so they're admonishing one another, or he's admonishing one another, that this is what they've got to do daily, daily. And I will warn you, when you are in a trial, do not isolate. That is a trick of the enemy. That's what he does to an animal. He gets the animal away from the, the, the group. What do you call it? The crowd. The pack. The pack or the herd. He gets them isolated. And once he has them isolated, they are so much weakened right there. And who does he go after? The strong ones? No. No, just like Amalek did. He goes after the weak. He goes after those who are struggling, the elderly. And I don't mean age here. But I mean those who are not doing what they need to do to feed themselves continually so that they stay in a place of strength. That trial is not to knock you out. That trial is not to see how many of you can God get to fail. That trial is to show you the character of God. He's wanting to get closer to you. He's wanting to pour more into you. He's wanting to encourage you. He's wanting to build you up. He's wanting to carry you through. And he's saying, take my burden. Give me yours. Throw it at me. Let go of it. Take mine. You know what mine feels like? It's light. It's easy. Well, I can carry a light and easy burden. Don't give me Roger's 50-pound pack, but I can carry a light and an easy. And that's what the Lord is saying, is he wants to be in that position to encourage you in that. And if you're not being encouraged in it, then you're listening, and you're hearing the hiss, and you're in danger of moving away from the very thing that you need the most that will help you. That thinking they're going to go back to the temple, you know what that's going to do? That's going to take them into apostasy. If they go back and they start trusting in Judaism and trusting in the, the shadows, they're going to miss the real. They're going to miss the reality of it all. But he's saying that's not what you people are. You Hebrew believers here, you've gone out and said you believed in Messiah. You've accepted Messiah. There's a difference here. And that's in verse 14. For we have become partakers of Messiah. If we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. Now that doesn't mean that if you have a, a day that you doubt that you're not saved. Again, what it's saying is if it's in you, if it's taken root in your heart, if you've really partaken 
has become a part of you, then that's going to carry you to the end. That's what happens as the Lord carries us. You're a co-participant with him. But that cannot be because your friends did it and you followed along. That can't be because your parents said this is the right way and you said, okay, I'll do it because mom and dad said it. That has to be the conviction of your heart. And if you have become a partaker, the Greek shows it again as a completed act. You know what that completed act in that Greek tense means? It means it happened at a point in time and the results go on forever. That's how God always refers to your salvation in scripture. It's never a start, stop, off, on. It happens at a moment in time and it goes forever in its results. That's what God has given us. And so he tells them to keep from the beginning. Keep that confidence you had. Don't listen. Don't allow this to, to come in and to influence you. All it's going to do is rob you of your joy. It's going to put you in a position that you're not going to be receiving the blessings of the Lord because it's going to take you to a dark place. And if you're in a dark place, I want to ask you, how did you get there? Because when the Lord walks with you, the word of God is a light unto your feet and a lamp unto your path. The pillar of fire at night, the cloud by day, they did not walk in darkness. They had perils. They had trials. They had an Egyptian army that wanted to, to take them out right in the beginning. They were facing hardship, but God never failed them. And they didn't walk in the dark wondering what was going to happen. So verse 15, he reminds them again not to harden themselves. It's a repeat for the emphasis there. Because of, of lack of time, I'm moving quickly into verse 16. Who provoked him when they had heard. I'm sorry, for, for who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moshe. The whole generation, the only exception was Yeshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb, they were the only two out of that entire generation. We don't know how many that was, but that was not a small number. That's an amazing, that's heartbreaking. But that was national unbelief. And I'll take you to Israel today. Israel has that heart today. There's a Yahshua. There's a Kalav. There's those who are calling it out who are saying, Israel, turn back to your God. Be strong in your God. Look to the God for your salvation. God will bring you past Hamas and past Hezbollah and past whoever else is coming at you. But nationally, they're falling away. They're not hearing because they've not in a place, they've not embraced, they've not accepted Messiah to hear the voice of the Lord. And the same way that the Lord did not end Israel in the wilderness, he does not end Israel in 2024 and beyond. He does not say that's an end of the nation. Those who will not come in, they miss out on the promise. But those who will come in by faith, remember the only way we can please God is by faith they go on to inherit the promise. Israel will go on and inherit the promised land, but you know what she says before she inherits? She says, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And you know when she says that? When she's looking up and she sees the Son of God coming back. She sees the nail pierced hand. She realizes and she mourns, wow, you were Messiah. You were here before. This is your second coming, not your first coming. And those who look in faith are saved. And they go into millennial blessing because God is faithful to his word. That should encourage every one of us also. God has promised you an eternal destination also. He's promised you a place literally out of this world. He's promised you a heavenly destination and it will not fail. You didn't buy pie in the sky. You didn't buy anything. He freely gave you and he will bring you home safely. Remember, he sealed you with the Ruach HaKodesh, the one who is keeping them away from hearing that hiss, the one who he's put within us. We don't have the cloud on the outside and the fire on the outside. We've got it on the inside, people. It can't get any closer than that. And you can't take it away from yourself. It's, he's in you. And he's wanting you to hear him, not the enemy. He's wanting you to see with spiritual eyes, hear with the spiritual ear, walk with spiritual feet, get out of the way and let God work. And you will see 
Your faith will be established. You'll be strengthened. That battle that you thought was so fierce that it, this is going to be the enemy, and I'm sure all of us have said at the time, God, this one's going to do it. This one's going to take me down. No, it won't if you turn to him. Don't provoke him. Turn to him. And so it goes on and he, and he, 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 in our scripture here, in verse I'm, I'm 16, I think. Uh, okay, indeed did not all those who came out of Egypt, we said that. And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned? His bodies fell in the wilderness, but to him did he swear that they would not enter into his rest, but to those who were disobedient. If you're being obedient, if you're, you're uh, I'm going to follow you, Lord. Say like Yahweh if you have to. Though you slay me, I'll trust you, Lord. That's what he said when he was losing everything. When he was going from one heartache to the next heartache to the next heartache. I cannot imagine. It was such a short period of time how one person could absorb all those hurts he was absorbing. And the only moment in time when he did lash out, God just nailed him and he realized it and he backed off fell on his face before God and said you know you are God and that's all we need to do in our agony cry out and thank him he's our God he's our Savior he's faithful and he will keep his word what he has promised he delivers and so he comes against those who are disobedient. He comes against those who have sinned. He comes against those that he did not allow them to have that rest. And here's the verse, Deuteronomy Do Do 12, that I told you about earlier. For you have not as yet come to the resting place and the inheritance which the Lord your God has given you. When you cross the Jordan and live in the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance, and it gives you rest from all your enemies around you so that you live in security. That's what he's promised Israel. That's what will finally come to Israel. But look how many millennia she's had to not have that because of unbelief. How sad. How sad. And here when it gives that word in verse 18 when it says to those who were disobedient. It's not your usual or who believe not. You may have that. And it's not the usual word. This is the one that again is showing defiance. It is saying that they absolutely refused to allow themselves to believe. In other words, the evidence was so convincing. And they still said, nope, I'm not going to believe it. That's a hardened heart. And that's what he was saying. That they're non-persuadable. They are absolutely in unbelief. It's not just a lack of faith. It's a willful refusal to trust God. Even as they did when Moshe was big, that, that, that third or fourth rebellion in our parsha, I think it's the fourth one, when they knew this was God's choice and they still came up against him and said, you've taken on too much yourself, you shouldn't be in this position, I should be in this position. That's, it was the bold faced lie, it was the pride and our pride gets us in the way all the time. Our pride will lead us to a heart of unbelief. And unbelief is the big disqualifier. It knocked them out of the promised land. It knocked the, the Hebrew the people who were professing. It knocked them out if they went back to the temple. And it will knock you out if you are not in faith saying, it's not my circumstances. It's not the trials. My God is faithful. The only way we can please God is to have the heart of faith. And God rewards that faith. Remember it says he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And just as he was promising Israel a national and earthly rest, he has promised us a spiritual rest. He has promised us a rest in Messiah. And that's the great difference. Israel in the wilderness was delivered from the bondage of Egypt. They started out with high hopes. And then the next thing you know is they're seeking to return to Egypt. And they're the ones who perished in the wilderness. The Hebrews in Paul's day were delivered from the bondage of the law. You don't get your salvation in the law. They had professed Messiah with zeal. They were out and out bold and loud. But now they were in danger of returning to the temple rituals, to the Judaistic laws. They were not looking to what those were presenting. And they would perish if they persisted. 
the, the original covenant does not save. It shows us our need for salvation. The salvation comes only in the Brit Hadashah, in the new covenant. And I don't mean in books, I mean the blood and the body of Yeshua that was shown to us from Pesach, that was shown to us from Yeshua, Isaiah 53, that was shown to us in Tehillim Psalm 22. We see it again and again and again. And he deals with this also in chapter 6 of the book of Hebrews and shows that there were many there that were enlightened. They got knowledge. They got facts. The light bulb was going on and they were catching on. But they didn't go from enlightened, being enlightened to being regenerated. They didn't allow it to come in. It stayed in the head and it didn't come to the heart. And facts will not save you. It's an opening of the heart. And that's why chapter 4 and verse 1 says, Therefore we must fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any of you may seem to come short of it. And I'm not here to scare you. Do I have salvation or not? You know. Because God doesn't play with you. He doesn't say, well, today I'll say you're safe, and tomorrow I'm going to tell you you're not. That's not God. And the qualification for salvation is putting your faith in God and in what he did through his son. That's where the bottom line is. So in, in light of the foregoing example, in light of Israel missing out, in light of this, don't be confident where you shouldn't be. Have a fear. Have a fear of God. There is a promise that remains. And that promise that remains is that God is going to bring Israel through nationally. But the greater promise is the spiritual. And God's going to bring us all through into a spiritual rest if we have a heart, a belief in him. He does say it very clearly for Israel in Tehillim, Psalm 132. He says, for the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. That means his dwelling place is Zion. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. That's why Israel can be so secure in the midst of her enemies. But again, don't fall short of the goal. What was happening was persecution. Many of you today, if I went around this room, I'm sure you could say you, you're, you've either been in a trial that you would consider a persecution, or you have been, you are, or you will be. I'll just put it that way, because as Brett Lori, I think, was the one that said it, for a believer, you're either in a trial, coming out of a trial, or going into trial. One of the three stages, and that's it. And in the original covenant, the persecutions were God's wrath very often. Not always, because look at you, oh, it wasn't. But very often, they would suffer consequences of their disobedience. But in the Brit Shah, it is clear again and again and again that the persecutions, that the trials, that they're there not as a, as a, a, a judgment, but they are there to grow us. They are there to test us to see where we're weak, where we need to shore up. That's what a good teacher does. A good teacher wants to know where your weakness is, not for their sake, but for you, so you'll learn where to show yourself at. Okay, I have a problem trusting God in this area. It might be finances. It might be workers that you can't get along with. It might be something I can't even think of right now. But you know what it is. And there will be a scripture. There will be something in the word of God that will tell you this is your answer. But if you're not reading his word, you don't know him. You don't know his character. You don't know his mercy and his tender loving kindness. You've got to get into the word. That's why faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. You see how it all comes together? The whole thing. What was wrong was the children of Israel weren't hearing. They were hearing the enemy. You know, if you have a radio station and you get it a little bit off, you have nothing but static on the line. And a lot of you in your spiritual life have static on the line. But if you tune in to the voice of your Lord and you're only listening to him and you get it fine-tuned, you hear him. I encourage you, make sure that you're tuning in and that you're hearing because where are you today? Faith, full assurance in the heart, that's what faith is. And that can't be mixed with anything else. Anything else is unbelief. It's fear or it's faith. It's unbelief or it's belief. 
The righteous shall live by his faith. That's exclusively trusting in Yeshua. What are you putting your faith in? You sat in a chair tonight and you didn't worry about going down to the ground, did you? You knew it would hold you up. You had no doubt. If I saw you come in and search that chair and turn it upside down and test it and make somebody else sit in it who weighs more than you, and then you sit in it, I would say, you've got a problem. But do you know they do that with God? They do. I don't know if I can trust you. you got to prove it to me. That's what was going on. Don't mix anything with your faith. Feed your faith and your fears will starve to death. Spiritually, how do your giants fall? Is by faith. How could little David, who's probably my size, how could he take Goliath, six foot nine, full of armor, roaring in the land shakes? How did little David take him down? That was my God. That was my God. I mean, God's the one who saw that rock go right to where he rocked this giant to sleep and down he fell. Do you have eyes of faith? Or do you have your eyes on the world? Are you looking at the giants or are you looking at the giant that is your God? Your eyes need to be on him. You're not of this world and your eyes need not be of this world. You've got to look with spiritual eyes, see the heavenly sights. You've got to hear with the spiritual ear. These are your aids. God's given them to you. So you can hear him, you can see him, you can walk in, his, in, in the, the path that he is directing for you. And as you walk by faith, you will suddenly realize that you're doing exactly where we started in Habakkuk. The just shall live by their faith. How do you live a life of faith? A step at a time in the Lord. Not in yourself, in the Lord. And that's where I'll leave it for tonight. I want to encourage you. I know, factually know, there are people in this room who are discouraged in their faith. I go in any room and say that. That's that's, uh, what's the word I want? Common to man. <clears throat> but I can also tell you, there's people in this room who know the secret. And they know, get into the Word of God. Spend time with Him. You want to know His character? How do you get to know somebody if you don't spend time with them? You don't get to know them. Somebody's caught your eye, you want to get to know them, you spend time. You listen to them. You look at them. Are you doing that with the one who loves you the most? Or are you filling your time with everything but and hearing the hiss of the enemy? Walk in your faith. Go with God. And I promise you the eternal deliverance. Hallelujah. He's never lost one and he never will. Bruce.